Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm so excited to be joined. Uh, my name is Lillian Corral, and I'm excited to be joined by Chris Thompson, um, my colleague at Knight Foundation, who heads up a Knight strategy in the city of San Jose. Hi, Chris. Hello, Lillian. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Um, so in the coast to coast tradition, um, I'm on the West Coast. What coast are you in? Even though we're, you're San Jose, where are you? Well, I'm on the coast of the Great Lakes today, uh, in, up in Ontario, Canada, heading home today. Perfect. Well, thanks for um, for joining me today. I'm really excited by the conversation. Um, the title of today's show is Data Driven. It's, it's driving decisions with local data. And as you, Chris, know, um, I love uh, data. Um, I am uh, I've been working with data and technology to try to, to try to drive government decision making um, for a while. And I think what's particularly exciting. So it's not a new topic, but what's particularly exciting about today's show is we're going to see a great example emerging out of your hometown, the city of San Jose, um, that's really about trying to both connect the data to the decision making, but also to equity and equitable outcomes. And that's really more an art than a science. Um, and it's not um, and it's not something that any you know city has really mastered. And so um, I'm really excited to hear the lessons um, that are being uh, learned in San Jose and how we can all um, take note. Um, and uh, we're going to be joined today by two awesome uh, women. First, Christine Quang from the City uh, of San Jose, the Chief Data Officer in the City of San Jose, and Panthea Lee, the Executive Director of Reboot, a social impact organization that's developing strategies to advance equity and justice, and also really looking at the intersection of innovation, innovation and intersectional solutions. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about what these two women can tell us. Um, and also, what one thing that we want to do in this show is really drive the conversation around this past year, because the context of doing this work is hard any time. Um, but this last year has been particularly difficult, um, right? Communities are really struggling with all kinds of issues. Um, and they're doing it, and, and they're trying to respond in very different ways. Um, you know, ways that are authentic to to where they are, their demographics, their uh, needs, um, and even the way you know their public perception about this pandemic. So um, I'm hoping that Panthea can give us also a really kind of high level sense of um, what's going on across communities and um, and how we should all kind of also take stock and think about the future. So um, so with that. Chris, um, tell us more about your um, colleague in San Jose and how um, and how the work of equity and data um, has emerged over the last year. Well, Dean and I started working together when she joined the uh, Office of Technology and Innovation at the city of San Jose about a year ago. It's, it's hard to believe because we've come so far in that time. I've been around smart cities since about 2007, which is kind of crazy when I think about it. And what was so exciting for me was when we started to talk uh, to Christine and the opportunity that was in front of her, she was taking a very different approach to solving the problem of bringing data into decision making. She was looking differently at the types of data she was going to use. And more importantly, she was driving towards a model that wasn't top down. All the other smart city stuff I've been around, and very, very top down, very city department or tech industry. Instead, Christine was uh, building them up. And for me, that was and I'd like her to just describe how she came to think about the project hey, this way. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Hey there. So I think your connection, we're having a little bit of issue with your internet connection. Um, I wonder if maybe we could restart that. And then while you're doing that, um, let me just sort of recap, I think, for folks what I what I believe you just said, which is um, which is a really important point about this sort of top down, bottom up approach and sort of as an intro to Christine. Um, if I'm right, Christine, I think what what what, tip was, what Chris was talking about is a lot of these efforts are sort of smart. When we talk about smart cities, we think about, you know, tech uh, visions driven a lot by the, the by the technology and the companies that are really driving it. Right. It's it's a tech, it's a solution and oftentimes in search of a problem. Um, and we think about that with data too, data driven decision making. Sometimes, you know, it's like, how am I going to make a decision at the top? It sounds like you you flip the switch a little bit, um, and that's what's bringing about some interesting results. So why don't you um, tell us a bit more, and um, and we'll wait for our colleague Chris to come back on. 
Sounds great. Thanks so much, Lillian, for the intro. And um, Lillian and Chris, Chris, not, um, I really appreciate the mentorship over the past year. Um, so like Chris mentioned, I am um, kind of non-traditional um, in terms of uh, in terms of my background, I joined the city um, through a fellowship from Harvard Business School, and I prior and this is actually my first full time public sector job. Um, I had only worked in organizations that um, kind of use data in cutting edge ways, which um, and I think I brought that perspective from working in high growth technology companies and hedge funds to the public sector when it came, at least when it comes to rigor and transparency, and so. Um, I thought one of the most interesting parts of serving in a data capacity in the public sector, and especially during a global pandemic, is you're kind of in this situation where, you know, I think the pandemic overnight kind of transformed the city into one of the largest platforms for service delivery overnight, right? So, I mean, I remember, you know, City Hall shut down March of last year, and we were responsible for everything from food delivery to making sure that hotspots were being you know, delivered for folks who were either unconnected or underconnected to the internet, um, you know, making sure that kind of the core services that, you know, folks lean on the government to provide continues to get provided in a digital format. And so there was a huge service delivery component to it. And there's also a huge opportunity to kind of make sure that as we're serving and doing our jobs throughout this pandemic, that we're doing it in a way that is driving equitable outcomes, right? That we're not just sort of meeting the bare minimum in terms of need, but that we're actually making it significantly better. And so um, I joined the city, um, gosh, I can't believe it's been a year. <laughs> it's it's really just, this time has really flown by. And um, I, I kind of, you know, my first couple weeks on the job was really just getting to know uh, my counterparts, my counterparts in the mayor's office, my counterparts um, on the city manager's office. And I had sort of joined right after another Knight Foundation equity in initiative called the Social Progress Imperative. Um, that kind of just took a very different approach from sort of how our team ended up doing it. So Social Progress Imperative um, used census data. And so this was an organization that kind of came in from the outside and um, used a much more, you know, top down, targeted approach in terms of understanding the performance of various city departments. And I and and I think the other thing I wanted to mention is the fact that social progress imperative was um, a program that was prioritized by the mayor and city council, but didn't necessarily have the same resonance with folks who are kind of the frontline operators in government. Um, and I think it was this whole survey was happening at the height of the pandemic. And so it was really interesting as I, you know, kind of joined my first few weeks, I was talking about equity and, and folks were telling me, oh, we just did that. We just wrapped up like an eight month long survey with the social progress imperative. And I, and I think um, I actually got a lot of really valuable insights out of SPI, but I think one of my biggest takeaways from that program was that the outcomes of that survey wasn't resonating from frontline operators. I think folks wanted to feel empowered from what they learned in data, and there was a gap when it came to using census data versus department-specific data. That's great. It sounds like you're, so you entered the city at the height of, you know, um, <laughs> The, the situation where data <laughs> yeah. is more, um, you know, it's, it's more valuable than ever. Um, it looks like Chris is back. Um, so maybe I'll transition back to him and you can just start telling us. So how the how this bottoms up approach um, actually really changed the dynamic around decision making. Um, maybe you could talk more specific about that. And Chris, I don't know if, if you want to frame the question differently, but go ahead. No, I'd, I'd go specifically to the projects you looked at. Again, for me, what was so attractive about them is that they were very small decisions that were being made relatively deep in the city. And I think you brought a, a different framework to really drive equity by making lots of small decisions broadly. So maybe talk about the PRNS scholarships, the 311 program, and how you came mm -hmm. to those projects. Yeah, so our very first um, data project was with the Parks and Recreation Youth Scholarships. I mean, this is this is one of the longest uh, running programs in the city. It's been around for over 10 years and has gone through multiple iterations of reform. And I think one of the really interesting things about working with Parks and Recreation was, you know, folks who work at community centers, they were very much on the front lines of the pandemic, right? They were thinking about the families and the young people that they were used to seeing day to day that they weren't able to kind of reach out to in the same way. And so it was a high priority program. And I was really grateful for the leadership of that department who kind of knew that it, the census wasn't really a good starting point for understanding how to address the need, especially in San Jose. So um, 
Parks and Recreation scholarships rely on the free, the federal free and reduced lunch metric to qualify folks. But um, at least in San Jose, the lowest income um, or, or what you, you know, the council district with the lowest household income, it's $78,000, right? And so there's a really huge gap between kind of using a federal standard for need and what's realistic at the local level. And so, you know, the department came to us and honestly just started with a really open-ended question. Are we doing a good enough job meeting the need in San Jose? And I think what I really appreciated about the fact that, first of all, you know, it was really helpful. I think we were able to do some things that outside organizations couldn't, um, which is literally just going to a San Jose community center, right? So I, you know, I have a team that, you know, wasn't just staying in the data set. So yes, we used the data set. We looked at registration data. We actually looked at the proximity of people who are able to benefit from the program and how far they lived from a community center. And we realized that, wow, 96% of folks who benefited from the program over the last 10 years live within a mile and a half from the nearest community center. That was interesting, right? But I think what we also did was the fact that we actually shadowed the front desk we, um, I actually, this was actually last Friday, uh, one of my team members dropped off like 20, like 2000 um, flyers at the local community center and just sat there and kind of like helped pass out the flyers and just help talk through folks who are starting to kind of go back to these community centers. And so there is this opportunity to kind of that kind of married like the rigor that comes with data, but with also the humility to recognize that data is only just, it only shows you part of the picture, right? And that you kind of have to be able to do both. The uh, the interesting part, I think, in our conversation, and so you're talking about the use of production data, so data that was widely available in the city, yes. not necessarily codified to be ingested and analyzed, but you also paid particular attention to future collection, uh, to the reliability of that data, to the continuous availability of that data. Do you want to talk about that and some of the work that you did inside the divisions to ensure that data would be available in the future and reliable? Yeah. Um, so, Chris, when you're saying production data, um, I, I would say it, this looks different for every single department we work with. Um, with Parks and Recreation, production data was the equivalent of registration data. So instead of looking at kind of, you know, very high level you know, demographic information from the census, we honestly just kind of went straight into kind of the city database to understand you know, over the last 10 years, who these programs were serving. And um, that was actually a really helpful starting point, I think, because it allowed us to build in the context of of reform, right? So again, this is one of the oldest programs. I think most folks in San Jose who have families, they know about these programs. This is a form of childcare, but there's been a lot of policy changes, right? There has been changes in terms of scholarship caps. There has been changes around eligibility. And so I think whenever we kind of start a new data project, we always want to embed that local context because you can see it in the registration data. You could look at, um, so things that we paid attention to, we were really interested in the distribution of folks who benefited across the city. We looked at proximity to community center, but we also paid attention to the differences between folks who have never, never benefited in the past and folks who we were able to retain, right? Um, this is a very kind of private sector way of looking at it, but I think if we think about government as, as a service delivery platform, I think bringing some of that thinking and, and, and marrying that with the goal of equity is one of the ways that we've been able to drive equitable outcomes. The other thing I think that was interesting for me is we talk a lot about data and we sometimes forget that there's always people, uh, people either yeah. that we're trying to understand or people making decisions. You're proposing some work in the city to actually bring, uh, not, not really create data scientists uh, within divisions and departments, but really to bring expertise so that people can understand the data that's available to them, but also the implications of the context that the data provides. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So we are, um, we have a phenomenal HR leader on the city manager side, and she is so passionate about um, just sort of building building comfort with numbers, right? And, and really kind of integrating data and using data to kind of make decisions and generate insights into kind of par into people's daily, into people's kind of daily, um, they're into people's day to day. And so uh, we are in the process of launching a data science data analysis bootcamp um, for folks in the city, it's going to be part of the learning and development program. And I think the reason why the timing on this is so important is because um, 
right now I'm actually leading a team of 20. I have a team of data scientists, data storytellers, and folks who are using data for community engagement in the mayor's office. But as we are embedded across seven, seven departments and seven programs, it's really important for us to also have counterparts in those departments who can continue to sustain the work and who actually have, quite frankly, more of that context on uh, more of that program management context than my team. And so that's actually kind of where, you know, 10, 10 months into this work, that's, that's where we're at. Um, you know, we have a really robust and diverse talent in on the mayor's office. And we're really excited to now build those skills inside the city manager's office. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting to hear you talk, Christine, because, you know, it just goes to show how every city is really going to do this in a very different way. And in almost in, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of for a lot of reasons, it kind of has to do that. Part of it is the governance structure. Part of it is the demographic, as you talked about, the income levels, you know, like in San Jose, 78,000 is actually, you know, like. It, it's actually a you know a need level that you wouldn't see in other parts of the country. So for all these reasons, cities really have to go about this um, in very unique ways. Um, I'd love to turn to Panthea, especially um, kind of tying it back to a point that you brought up um, a couple a couple minutes ago about equity, um, and that we really have to. Um, we really have to define equity in very fluid ways in, in, in some ways that, because every city is different. Um, Panthea, why don't we start just by, one, hearing more about you, Reboot, and the kind of role that you typically pay, play in, civic, in the civic innovation space. And then maybe let's talk about this question of equity um, and how cities are really trying to address equity, yes, with data and in other, and in other ways. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, that was really fascinating. Thank you, Christine. So, um, so my background is in um, ethnography, in design, in service design, and in facilitation. And I think the role that I tend to play in this space is I often act as an organizer, a bridger, a mediator across diverse communities that often don't talk to each other or might have quite negative stereotypes on, um, around one another. So activists and government, um, community groups and international institutions, and trying to bring everyone to the table to address these historical differences and co-create together. Um, and so, you know, been doing this work globally in the open data and open government space, helped organize the Open City Summit in Argentina, um, done a lot of global South work. And then also here in New York City, where, where, where I'm based, um, we've done a lot of work with the city um, around driving more equitable, accessible approaches to using open data with um, Kelly Jin, who was a chief analytics officer before Knight stole her. Um, and, you know, most recently on the 10 year roadmap here. Um, and so that's kind of the perspective that I'm bringing to all this. And I think just to the point around, you know, questions around equity in this point, in history, in the sort of point in time that we're at now, I think it is such a um, it is such a necessary conversation and such a fraught one as well. Um, I think what we've seen in the last year is I see a lot of folks freezing up right now, you know, um, for lots of reasons. We've all had our personal things to attend to. It's been a difficult year in so many ways, and I think um, over the course of the crisis, we saw politics getting more intense. Folks were throwing out regular protocols, and I think you know. And then you know, we were um, we were engaging in what do we do now in ways that are not the norm. And I think that um, and 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 then I think with the murder of George Floyd and the racial justice uprisings, um, and then many rightful critiques of biases of blind spots in data. I think I saw a lot of folks not then really knowing how to engage around these conversations. What does data-driven decision-making mean if we can all agree that there are historical blind spots, there are biases in the data that we have? And you saw, I think, a lot of groups either form, such as Stop AAPI Hate, who said, you're not collecting data on our communities, to folks that have been doing this work for a long time, um, Data for Black Lives, um, the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab, um, you know, AI for the People, others sort of coming together and trying to say, well, this is, these are other sources that we need to be looking at. And I think we haven't really found, as we're trying to deal with a pandemic, found how to then have all of these conversations all at once. And I think as a result, um, I think there's been a lot of frustration with government, rightly and wrongly. Um, I think the national level narrative 
when the states are playing the Hunger Games with PPE. You know, I think I, I think sometimes outside folks tend to treat government as a monolith. And so at a local level, you started seeing folks setting up their own initiatives, mutual aid initiatives, whatnot. They were saying, this is a more equitable way to deal immediately with the injustices, the blind spots that I'm seeing in my own communities. Government is not stepping up. And I think there's merit, there's, you know, I've been involved in a bunch of these efforts. I think there's merit to them. And I think that in that, that, that narrative that it perpetuates that government will never do the right thing, that is also not helpful for us either. So anyway, I'll, I'll sort of, yeah. I'm, I, I see we're having this, um, we're, we're, we're having a tough time having these conversations right, right now and finding trusted spaces where we can engage in an honest dialogue. Do you think if we've learned anything over the past year about the importance of moving? The pandemic, for example, didn't offer us an opportunity to sit back and freeze. And arguably the, the unrest and the trauma we've had over the last two years didn't offer that opportunity either. Do you think that helps us see a way forward with more direct involvement, um, more direct engagement as part of this build back better phase in recovery? Yeah, I hope so. I I have very mixed. I I am flip flop on this question almost um, daily or <laughs> hourly. I think at the beginning of the pandemic, I think we saw a lot of. I think many of us were cheering. We saw suddenly a bunch of progressive policies being passed seemingly overnight. We were treating, you know. Um, refugees, undocumented folks with dignity. We were housing the homeless. You had cities, you know, like Amsterdam and Copenhagen adopting donut economics. And, um, you know, and then suddenly it was like, we're all in this together. We're going to help one another. And I think at a macro level right now, what we're seeing with the, um, you know, I keep going back to the, um, the big pharma fight with WTO IP waivers and, you know, like literally blocking ways for folks to live now that you know, we in the US have bought ourselves out of the pandemic. Like there are things around sort of human nature and capitalist incentive that do not give me a lot of hope. And yet at the same time, I think you also see folks that are, um, that have found new agency, you know, that have, you know, I think a lot of the emergency distribution of, of PPEs, a lot of, you know, mutual aid efforts. I think that has, um, that has given folks new hope around where they want to go. I see a lot of people leaving jobs and institutions that they don't think aligns with their values and their politics anymore. Um, and I think that, I think there's a helpful shuffling going on. And at the same time, there's a lot of, I think institutional task forces, working groups, commissions right now that are being formed to address these um, new challenges and new lenses that have been there for a long time, but there's now just broader cultural awareness um, and I'm and I'm mixed on where those are going to go. I think most of them, for the large part, actually follow pretty traditional ways of how we're going to solve problems. In New York State, for example, um, Governor Cuomo appointed our uh, one of our top surveillance state lobbyists, um, you know, uh, Eric Schmidt, to lead a commission to reimagine New York. And the things that have come out of that are really around affordable broadband, telehealth, whatnot very important things to invest in. But if we're going to reimagine New York entirely, who should be at the table? What are the things that are really going to structurally change? Um, because, you know, the folks that got us into this mess are not going to get us out. And until we can try and, you know, really reframe these efforts, bring different people to the table, um, I worry that we're saying the right things and not necessarily going to deliver on them. Yeah, I want to pick up on one of these um, points and maybe get more specificity around what's happening in, in communities, Panthea, especially around yeah. mutual aid work. But let me just prompt our audience, if you're out there and you have a question, please feel free to put it in the comments, in the chat. If you're on Facebook or Twitter, you can always um, ask a question on, on Twitter. You can just use the night live hashtag. Um, but so Panthea, I've, I've heard a lot about obviously the mutual aid work that's happening in communities, but some of our, um, our audience may not know. Can you just describe exactly what emerged over the last year when we talk about these mutual aid networks? Like, what does that really look like? And then maybe start to tee up a little bit, I think, to tie it back to Christine's work. It's, I mean, you're talking about 
you know, mutual aid work that happens in community. And then there's efforts like Christine's that are happening within these institutions. At what point do these things kind of come together to, as you described, maybe really re-envision um, a more equitable, inclusive, dynamic future that's also resilient, right? Because we also yeah. have to be better prepared for any kind of future um, pandemic, uh, emergency, uh, natural disaster, whatever, you know? Right, right. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I, I can share a little bit of what I've seen and would love Christine's thoughts on this too. You know, I think that, I mean, mutual aid, I think is not new. Um, it's been happening all around the world. I think it is human nature, um, even though sort of modern political theory tells us otherwise. And I think that what we saw during the pandemic was really people banding together to help neighbors in need, you know? And this is certainly not unique to Brooklyn where I am, um, but I think what is unique about the mutual aid group that um, I'm part of is, I mean, seemingly overnight, I think within like three weeks, it was a more sophisticated, um, you know, ticket tracking, uh, you know, issue re resolution system and sort of network than I've seen on many, frankly, like public sector, social sector programs. And I think that is, I, th I think there's larger challenges with that because, you know, these were effectively a lot of um, engineers, data scientists, designers that the public sector often can't afford. So suddenly we're sort of, you know, channeling these people um, into doing sort of this voluntary work, which tends to paint government as a negative, you know, you come and do a tour of duty or you kind of avoid it as at all costs and then you set up the separate system, um, but that's a separate. And, you know, um, here in Bed-Stuy, uh, this group, I think, collected about over $1 million, um, delivered groceries, essential supplies, medicines to about, I think, 10 or 15% of the population here. And I think it was a really good stopgap in a point, because frankly, folks criticize government for not being able to be nimble, and I get it. Like having worked with government, government's good at some things, it's not great at others, you know? And so I think it was coming in to fill in, in the gap. Um, and I think there's really beautiful, heartwarming work. At the same time, how these intersect, I think I heard a lot of folks um, at City Hall um, within the mayor's office wanting to connect with these, thinking about, okay, how can we leverage these as information distribution channels, as last mile delivery um, sort of, you know, uh, channels, leverage the infrastructure, the civic infrastructure that has been built. At the same time, I worry that I think a lot of those don't end up moving forward and we end up designing our own separate systems because we don't necessarily trust one another on both sides. You know, on the mutual aid side, I think, and with a lot of organizers I know, I think there's almost like an instinctive, you know, you're from a big institution, we can't trust you because of the big narratives that we have. And then I think in a lot of governments and international agencies and whatnot, I think folks are also nervous to reach out because you don't necessarily have incentive for sticking your neck out. There's procurement, legal structures, you know, all sorts of battles that we have to face in terms of actually integrating with these more informal networks that don't have formal registration. There's a lot of like logistical challenges. Um, but I but I really think that now that we're out of immediate firefighting mode, I think there are real opportunities to sit down and learn from one another. What are you good at that we are not? And then, you know, on the government side, you have mandate, you have resources in a way that these groups are quite vulnerable. Uh, they're quite precarious. They're not necessarily sustainable or resilient. Um, and, and, and how do we leverage the reach and the resources of government to help them um, be sustainable and continue delivering for communities in the, long, in, the, in the long run? And I think that's a really interesting opportunity. Yeah. Something that emerged early in San Jose uh, during the pandemic was the Silicon Valley strong model. And it really brought together uh, organizations from nonprofit, for-profit, government, uh, religious organizations to, to help soothe and uh, care for the city during the pandemic. And as we look forward, we've seen a lot of positive work there, but then I, I pivot into the work that Christine's leading right now. And what I'm seeing is the mayor's office coming together with the Office of Economic Development, with the Downtown Association, and an expanding group of other nonprofits to, to start to pivot into the future. And that's not something we've seen in the past. Do you just wanna talk about the work you're doing, Christine, with the Downtown Association, what's being proposed there? Yeah, this is um, this is a very new model where a 
Um, so today, uh, before kind of we finalized a partnership with the San Jose Downtown Association, you know, a lot of our work has really just been kind of internal change management, right? We've completely embedded ourselves in IT and parks and recreation and public works, um, even honestly working with the fire department right now. Um, and, and we had this really great opportunity where the San Jose Downtown Association came, with, uh, came to us. They were really, I think they've just it was all word of mouth. Um, I, honestly, our team is busy enough that I don't do any business development. Um, and they actually just came to us and asked if we would be willing to help them um, kind of think through, like help them set an equity objective for, you know, as they're thinking about small business recovery in the city and then help them establish a set of metrics to hold them accountable. And I just thought this was such a great opportunity to kind of introduce like the community stakeholder into our work. And I think um, I think just because the relationship with San Jose Downtown Association has gone so well, it really inspired us actually for how to bring a lot of the data work we're now doing with other departments into the community. And so, you know, to date we have, um, my team has reached out to 300 community organizations in San Jose. And when I say um, community organizations, it is everybody from, um, you know, we work with uh, legal youth advocates to faith-based organizations. We have had calls with 60 of them. Um, we, we actually took a lot of the data work, we've made it publicly available, and we've condensed them into 15 minute presentations. No, sorry, mm -hmm. five minute presentations for 15 minute calls. And 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 every and we had to have an internal metric where um, the folks who are working on the data, for every single data analysis you do, you have a conversation with a community organization. And where that's actually translating to is at the end of July, we're actually going to be hosting roundtables, um, not just about the data work, but about the programs that the data, you know, that that the data is providing insights on. And we're really hoping that by bringing, um, you know, city department leaders in and also community organizations, that can actually lead to the meaningful reforms. Um, so it doesn't just feel like an internal change management; it's change management with input from key stakeholders. I'd love to pick up on that. It sounds like, you know, Panthea was talking about this issue of trust and. What's ironic is a lot of the, I feel like a lot of the push for more data-driven government was this belief that if we relied on more data, we could have more equitable decision-making. Um, but the, the honest truth for all the reasons we've talked, bias, et cetera, um, data doesn't actually lead to equity. Um, it, it, you know, it doesn't actually give us the right answer, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of this is about the work of building trust. Um, so it sounds like, Christine, what you just described is at least an I'm I'm editorializing, but it's, it sounds like an attempt to try to bring in the community and perhaps connect it to that data work and start to build some of that trust. Is that is that what you're talking about? And and what other advice can you give, you know, the folks in the audience about how how do we start to build that trust? and still do the data work? Because I don't think we just give up on data altogether, but we clearly, it's not the answer. So what do we pair it with? How do we really advance trust in this digital world? Yeah, I think I think data can build trust if it's done in a way, like humility kind of has to be at the center of our work. Like, I, again, I feel, I keep referencing my team, right? But I, I gotta emphasize, like I have, um, a, a wonderful team where the programs we study aren't intellectual exercises for us. Like even for me, you know, I know what it's like to sign up for food stamps. I, um, these aren't, yes, we have the technical skills to now make a difference, but there's a lot of empathy and humility to our work. And so I think when data is studied but presented in a way where you could actually create choices, that's, I think, that's when people don't feel immobilized for, you know, by the data. But I think there's also, um, you know, I think the fact that we even changed the data source, right? So we're not working with survey data, right? Which tends to be biased. And, um, you know, there's a lot of underreporting <laughs> with survey data, but we're actually just working with, we're looking at kind of who we were able to help. It, I think it points, I think it's, I think we've kind of saw, I think we're changing the conversations we have with the community because it's not just about, you know, what the program has been lacking, but I think it's been helping us understand where the areas of opportunity is, right? So, you know, I keep going back to parks and recreation, but if you go to our blog, we actually have a lot of other projects going on. But I want to give you one tangible um, point of decision that we're going to be having with community organizations and parks and recreation at the end of July, which is around, um, which is actually around 
zip codes, right? So we have this, we have six zip codes that we pay a lot of attention to the city. And right now we were able to actually use the data to understand that over the last 10 years, 50% of scholarships given out are concentrated in those six zip codes. And we had the most interesting community or a con or like conversations where, you know, there are some folks who feel like they should just have their own scholarship, right? Or it should be much more than 50%. And then I actually have also had really interesting conversations with folks who tell me that it should be better distributed across the city because there's also hidden need in cities or in hidden needs in communities with higher median incomes, right? I'm talking to parents who are telling me, um, one of them quit their job just so they didn't so just so they didn't increase the threshold to qualify for subsidized scholarships. And today these scholarships are only subsidized at the 75% level right and so this is kind of just an example of like these are the real conversations we're having it's not really about the data but the data has been a really great starting point mm -hmm. and i christine i i just really love what what you're saying there a bringing folks in to have conversations around the data the data doesn't matter we know there's problems there but how do you open up and bring people in and i think um i just love the example that that, that you just gave because i think i've done civic engagement work for so long and i am very, very tired of most of it, you know, because I think so often we tell people, but so often I think we tell people, your voices matter. We want to hear what you have to say. Give us your ideas. And and we mean well, you know, um, I've, I've been there. You mean well, you, you kind of take that information. And then afterwards, what happens is, you know, one of two things. I think one is you go upstream and you realize you actually can't do this. There are sort of institutional barriers. There's red tape, there's whatnot. And so, you know, then, you, you mean, you, you really want to take that sort of, you know, voice process and sort of feed it in somewhere, but you struggle, or you get a lot of different competing ideas. You know, there's lots of different stakeholders, community doesn't all think the same thing. So you get a lot of different ideas. And then you, as the person that collected all of them, have to synthesize that into a cohesive policy or cohesive design. And that's really difficult too, because then everyone's angry at you. You know, you're like trying your best, but everyone is frustrated with something that you did not do. And so I think a lot about, yeah, what does it mean to bring everyone together to work with humility as you're saying and say, I don't know all the answers. I'm going to tr do my damnedest. But, you know, I think bringing people along the journey with you, hel helping folks see where your battles are going to be as well helps, I think, build a lot of trust and understanding. And, you know, we're in this together because I think so often, um, you know, we end up saying, I'm on this side, you're on this side. We can only touch at these specific points. So I love that. What what really Thank impressed you. me about the work uh, that Christine was leading was that it, it helps get away from that model where everybody has a role. The very next decision you need to make uh, is one that you can make to build equity. And I loved the way that Christina was approaching this, uh, Christina was approaching large scale transformation by giving everybody a role, everybody an opportunity to move something forward and make it better. Yeah, and, and this note about choice. I mean, I mean, this could be, we, we're always trying to use data to like get an answer, but what if we're just, using data to give people like to reduce the number of choices or options and kind of help just maybe that's the helping in decision making it's not telling you that you do a or b but it's just telling you hey in a world of a b c d you know pick one you know uh, pick one or the uh, pick a or b um i just I, I think that this is really interesting exploration and i'd be curious to see christine in like a year or how how you're tracking perhaps the way that people are making decisions. Um, makes me think about the work you do, Panthea, around ethnography, right? Like a lot of that is just really studying in some ways, um, you know, human behavior and the way that people um, consume information, make decisions, things like mm -hmm. that. Right. Um, really powerful. Um, we have a quick question um, in, well, actually not a quick question, but it's a pretty powerful question um, from the audience about, you know, government's ability to um, to really serve all, and yet it has this mandate to serve all. So I'm just going to ask. So, you know, um, in the in the comment section, government is constrained by the politicization of public dollars. You know, and collectively, we want the social safety net um, the government provides to um, to benefit everyone. But um, what is the appetite for true innovation, delivering public so social services? Um, it, that impacts the community we live in 
it sounds like writ large and not just directed at limiting at eliminating poverty, um, but perhaps strengthening the middle class, increasing public health education. Um, and the, the you know the thing that thinks this make this question makes me think about is. Um, are we missing kind of a broader picture perhaps in not strengthening all of, you know, like a broader set of, of pillars that help, that will actually help people really like step up from poverty if we're just so focused on that individual. I mean, it's a trade-off, right? We can focus on just eliminating poverty or we can focus on maybe strengthening a lot of these other systems that either prevent people from falling into poverty or when you kind of get them you know, better positioned yeah. that can uh, help them stay, you know, in the middle class and, and, and moving. I'm hoping I understood and captured that question well, but I don't know if you guys have reactions to that. Yeah, I can, please. <laughs> I can jump in here. So um, I had mentioned that we are now embedded across seven departments. And I think what's been really, I think what's been just such a great experience um, through working with the data is understanding what equity means to each department. I don't, you know, I haven't really worked with a single department or, you know, honestly, individual who says equity doesn't matter. I do think that um, folks go, come into this job, public servants want to serve all, and they want to serve all of their residents to the best of their ability and for them to kind of experience that service the same way. That consistency is really important. And so it's been really interesting to even have conversations um, with the San Jose 311 team, um, which is, you know, it's it spread out across IT and public works. And they're the folks that you call um, for garbage disposal and to report graffiti and sometimes illegal fireworks um, to, to San Jose Youth Scholarships, right? Which is for families who qualify, you know, for this program, right? It, it, uh, and it's been really interesting to kind of realize that I don't think it's about equalizing service delivery at all. Right, but it is about basically understanding the department specific context, their unique challenges, and how to make sure that as they're doing their jobs day to day, there is that kind of consistency of experience across the like across the city. Right. I think certain um, three one one is a really interesting example where th there are geographical differences, right, in terms of population densities and transportation access that makes service delivery for something like three one one different, right? And so if you go in and you try to, you know, have a mandate around trying to equalize, you know, service delivery times for every single type of service in every single council district, it might not be realistic, right? And so maybe a better way to think about it is just more from the resident perspective, right? And making sure that maybe people like satisfaction is consistent across the district, but also if you're going to go ahead and track satisfaction, making sure that we're doing as good of a job as possible in trying to measure that, right? So this is kind of an example where even 301 is one, you know, the approach around equity and even the types of analysis, the dashboards we're building for them is very, very different from a targeted program around youth scholarships. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just jumping in on that too, um, I, I'm not sure if I totally understood the question, but um, w w one way that, that that I think about these questions around equity, what does it mean to serve all is, um, you know, I mean, like Lillian, you, you and I have been in the e-government, open government, sort of start seeing that evolution of the space. And I think so often what we have talked about, I think the language of success in this space is about, um, for a long time, has been about efficiency. And mm -hmm. we try to de-politicize it. We don't talk about equity. We don't talk about justice. And so mm -hmm. it's so exciting, you know, from the conversations I've seen, and Christine, sounds like, you know, with, with your teams and everyone that you're working with, we're having these conversations like front and center now. And I think what's challenging too, though, is um, in this space, I think we tend to take an ahistorical approach to how we move forward. We tend to look at the data at this point in time. And I think what we're having now in this country is we are having a reckoning with history. I think, you know, conversations that were fringe or we weren't talking about before, you know, suddenly, whether it's, you know, reparations, critical race theory, um, transformative justice, all of these, I think we're having sort of conversations about now. And I think that says to me, you know, we have to look at equity, not just at this point in time now and how do we serve everyone equally, but what, um, but how have we gotten to this state, this state of play now, this state of precarity for, you know, black and brown communities, communities of color, like what does that mean? And I think, and that, I, I, and I think that's hard. I, I think we don't necessarily know how to have these conversations in the workplace right now. Um, yeah. And I think some folks like deal, you know, want to deal with this stuff personally sort of 
professional. Like it's all, and I think we're we're, not, we're right now trying to figure out how to have these conversations. But I think something that I will say is, when I'm in these debates with folks, I think they tend to think, do we do this or that? Do we have a heavily equity oriented approach, or not? Do we not? But you know, um, like <laughs> it's either this or that. And I think that what we need to recognize is we're in a moment of experimentation. I think we have to be as great courageous and you know like reckon with history as much as possible but also we can one take portfolio approaches to our work you know because i think also there is a lot of fear um there's a lot of fear right now around sense of loss for different communities you know what so i think a we need to learn how to deal with that what does a portfolio approach mean and then also what does transition design mean i think this is something that we're not mm. talking about a lot you know for folks that are saying Reform doesn't work. We need abolition. You know, like I can see how both sides that conversation is very polarized right now. And I get both camps. Um, I mean, I do. I, I get this camp a bit more. But in between, how do we how do we design, you know, and how do we use data to bring everyone to the table? This is where we are. This is historically where we've been. This is where we have to get to. But how do we set sort of different metrics for ourselves so that we get there? Because right now it's either one or zero. And I don't think that's getting us very far in this debate. Yeah. Well, we have to wrap up, um, but I think to your point though, Panthea, just the last thing I'll say is, and this is why I applaud my colleague Chris and Christine in this work is, you know, it sounds like the San Jose work really started from a place of, you know, something that didn't go quite as planned and maybe not as quote unquote successfully or as equitable as planned. And then they were comfortable a bit with that and didn't just give up on it altogether, but it sounds like you pivoted and you built on those um, lessons and you've now developed and you've really developed now a model that you're feeling has a lot more potential and is moving decision-making forward. So um, so that's exactly what we're talking about. Don't be afraid of experimentation. All right, well, this is an amazing conversation. We're gonna wrap up. Thank you ladies for joining us. Um, and for the audience, this is really part of just the beginning of a conversation we're having at night at what we call our Smart Cities Lab. Um, this year, um, the Smart Cities Lab 2021 is happening at the end of the month. It's really a place where Knight brings together its grantees around the Smart Cities space um, and thought leaders um, to talk about what's happening in communities, what's working, what's not working, um, but also like where should we be pushing the bounds? And so we're going to have conversations around data and digital innovation, around broadband, all of the opportunity that is available out there with broadband. What do we do with that funding? It's not just about um, ensuring that there's fiber connectivity out in every community, but really it's like what happens after that? Um, we're going to talk about autonomy and the continuing levels of autonomy we see in our cities and the impact that has on equity. And also what does equitable recovery really mean and what's the role of technology and helping spur that on. So if you've joined us today and you love this conversation as much as we did, um, please join us um, the 29th and the 30th for some of the open um, sessions we'll have there. Um, Chris, any last parting thoughts or? No, thank you. I, this is a great conversation. I appreciate being here today. Thank you. Um, yes. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us.